One of our guests of the day, the other one today, is a man you may recognise, or maybe you don't. Jordan Peterson has achieved that rare feat, becoming a global superstar academic. So how did he become so well known? He first came to national prominence in Canada in 2016 in a debate about new laws on gender identity. Bill C-16 made it an offence to refuse to call someone by their chosen gender pronoun. Jordan Peterson argued that this would infringe free speech while some supporters of the bill said he was advocating prejudice. From there, his YouTube star took off, and he has now over one million subscribers. And his videos, where he talks everything from identity politics, which we've touched on, to the Bible, to Disney movies, have been viewed over 150 million times. Gosh, that's about the same number of viewers we have on this program. Huh. Last year, he supported ex-Google employee James Damore, who had been fired for suggesting men and women have different interests due to biological differences. And which his latest book, sense now. 12 Rules for Life, has taken him on a global tour promoting his ideas and just this week he sold out the 1000 seater Emmanuel Centre around the corner here in Westminster. Um, so Jordan you've done endless interviews you've been publicizing yeah. you've been publicizing your book and they've generated plenty of heated debate. And I actually sold out the Apollo it had 5,000 seats. All right stop boasting. Um, <laughs> Talk your shit, do you Jordan. think though because of the heat that has been generated that your views have been misrepresented at times? Oh, definitely, but that's, you know, that's part and parcel of the process. I did take a very um, uh, forceful stance, let's say, against some of the excesses of the radical left-wingers, and it's in their best interest to paint me as uh, somehow a figure of the extreme right, because then I don't have to be contended with. But, I mean, it's easy for people's views to be oversimplified in a very large public debate. I mean, in terms of some of the issues, I mean, you say you've been uh, painted as, a, as a, an extreme right winger. No, or, some or, people have tried yeah. that. Not very successfully, but they've tried it. And you came to prominence um, in part over your opposition to this law that we just talked about yeah. in Canada, proposing the use of preferred pronouns for transgender people. Mm. Just for clarity. Mandating them. Yeah. Right. Saying that, was that you the should issue. do it. No, but, that you had to do it. Uh, right, you had to do it by right. law. But just for clarity, do you think a trans woman is a real woman? I don't really like the way those questions are formulated. You know, I don't know what that means. What do you mean a real woman? Well, she I'm asking you, in your mind, you know, it depends what you think a real woman is, but do you think a trans woman is a woman? This would have been a perfect opportunity for Jordan to ask her, well, what's your definition of what a real woman is? Let's go. No. Why not? Because I think that women are capable, generally speaking, of having babies, and they have female genitalia, and they have an XX chromosome, and, and I think the biological markers are relevant. It doesn't necessarily mean that I don't think that people should be treated with respect and dignity if they happen not to fit easily into a gender category. That's a different issue. Right. But, but it's a matter of definition, yes. and, and I actually think it's a foolish argument relevant. in some sense, because what do you mean by real? Well, I mean, you've just clarified that, though. You, you, you don't think um, that a trans woman is a woman. And do you, do you think that that is what is behind or explains your opposition to this idea of a law mandating you to use a no. preferred pronoun is because you don't actually believe that that's the truth, that a trans woman is a woman and therefore you can't use that pronoun? No, that's not my argument at really? all. Really? Yeah, really. My yeah, argument is that the no, government I know what your shouldn't compel is. voluntary speech. No, but I know what your argument is, and no, you've made it very really clearly. It. But, no, but behind, that's exactly it. There's the no motivation behind, behind no motivation it. behind it. But you don't believe I wouldn't put everything on my online in my life to take the stance I did unless I had thought that through very deeply. And I've thought it through very deeply. There aren't hidden motivations that have to do with some arbitrary prejudice against trans people. Okay. It's purely, pure and simply... Mandated this. Speech. There's never been a time in English common law history where the government compelled speech and the Canadian government dared to do that. And that was unacceptable. And they masked it with this show of, of compassion for the oppressed. And I don't buy it. Right. But you would. You ask him a baited question, then you refuse to let him answer until he took over the conversation. You're not letting him finish what his argument is and concluding for him what you think his argument should be. But as I think you've said at an individual level, mm. if somebody Wouldn't asked have. you, if you know, somebody asked you to use a particular pronoun, you would do mm. so. Well, I have. You have? Yes. Right, fine. Yes. Let's talk about feminism. Are you a feminist? Uh, no, not as it's currently defined, certainly not. No, uh, well, in any other definition? Well, I think that anybody who doesn't think that the, the competitive landscape should be opened up 
for equality of opportunity is not thinking. And so everyone's interests are better served if people have as equal access to opportunity to display their talents and to manifest their talents in the world as possible. So in that sense, certainly. But feminism now, it's as far, and this is why it's so deeply unpopular, a very small minority of women in the UK identify as feminists. And the reason for that is it's primarily become an ideological weapon. And it's an ideology that I don't, I, I detest actually, the ideology that it's associated with, collectivist ideology. Right, I mean, okay, and that's your view about feminism. Aisha, are you a feminist? Oh, absolutely. I'm a very proud uh, feminist. Here and when go. I was um, a special advisor in government, I worked on women and equality issues, and I was very proud, actually, of a piece of legislation I got on the statute book with my former boss, Harriet Harman, the Equality Act uh, in 2010, which strengthened our anti-discrimination um, laws. And I fought very hard to get more women into public life, into the Labour Party, and yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm very, very proud of being a feminist, hence my pink dress. Oh, well, <laughs> all right. Um, obviously reverting to type then Absolutely, in the pink dress. Absolutely, well. Um, <laughs> you would like men to regain or reclaim their strength physically, mentally and morally. Is that broadly correct? I would say morally, fundamentally, but I think the other things go along with that. Right, and, and if that But is... it isn't men precisely who I'm, who I'm speaking to, it's, it's people. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm actually interested in individuals, and I'm interested in their fortification against tragedy. You know, every time I do an interview, the interview is always political. It's always mm. political. Well, the, and clue, the clue is in the title of this program. <laughs> we are the Daily oh, Politics. Oh, no, no, fair enough. No, 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 <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And I'm, I'm not casting aspersions <laughs> at this program, but the fundamental news that's important about what I'm doing isn't the political element. And the people who but talk what? to me don't talk politically. They well, say they've watched but, but my part, lectures. But part and of that it is, sorry, is mm. that I think for a lot of people, the kind of personal does become the, 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 the political. Or well, the political becomes the personal. Yeah, and I think in terms of the... Yeah, the, but the, in the, this situation, a lot of people are wrong because primarily what's happening is people are watching my lectures and as a consequence, their lives are improving dramatically. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure they are. I'm sure people are like, have had a huge conversion after it's and they're much happier once they've been... It's not a conversion. Happier, it's not a been, conversion. But it's, what, it's what I would like to do is, is kind of almost... I think at the moment, the discussion about feminism is very d d divisive and it, sometimes it can sort of be like, Okay, men have to lose and women have to gain. Actually, mm -hmm. everybody has a lot to gain mm. by greater equality. Now, whether you get the equality of outcome that you want, I think only time will tell. But certainly, equality of opportunity is is very important. And actually, well, we can agree a lot on that. and a lot of men would would benefit from that. So I think a lot of it, men men are having a lot of crises at the moment in terms of mental, mental health, mm. suicide issues, and um, their own sense of identity. Because I think some of the stereotypes put on men are quite limiting for them as well. I think they make men quite unhappy as well. The so devil's in the details with regards to equality because I'm a, an advocate of equality of opportunity. But and I outcomes. Think the idea, outcomes, that's an, that's an appalling terrible. doctrine. Why? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hang because on. you well, have to produce an unbelievably potent bureauc bureaucracy to make the ever greater and ever finer distinctions that are necessary to enforce equality of outcome. How many group differences are you going to equalize across? Is it just gender and sex? How many genders? No, so gender and ethnicity? How many genders? I think How many what, ethnicities? What are, How many races? <laughs> we'll let Aisha answer. I think what, what people are trying to do with this, and certainly as somebody who you know has looked to do sort to sort of do this myself, I think you set yourself ambitions for, for what you would like to see, and then you try and remove as many of the, the structural barriers and mm. obstacles. So you try and create that you know fair crack of the whip mm -hmm. and that equality of opportunity to see where you get to with the outcomes. That, that's now, fine. Now we are in very early stages. It's only a hundred years since you know women got the vote mm. in this country. You know we have had a long established patriarchal society and set up for, for a long time in the world in this country. So I think we have a long way to go to see where it plays out. There is no country in the world where you know we really do have gender equality um, properly yet in terms of dis real decision making and, and real Some of the power. Scandinavian countries maybe? But I, th they're still not quite there and I think All you've right. spoken a lot about this. Scandina there's still a way to go in Scandinavia. Things are not perfect well, in I Scandinavia haven't, I haven't at all. Well I spoken about that specifically. I've spoken about You spoke about the right stuff yesterday. I, you talked about the Scandinavian. Well I've spoken about the fact that, you see, one of the things that's happened in the analysis of the differences between men and women is that the social constructionist claim is that mm. the differences are socially constructed, mm. right? Is that it's a consequence of environment that men and women differ. But what the scientific literature indicates is that as cultures become more egalitarian, like they have in Scandinavia, 
the differences between men and women actually increase rather than decreasing, which is a direct repost to the social constructionist view. So they just deny all that. The biggest differences in the world in interest and temperament are between Scandinavian men and women. It's exactly the opposite of what everyone predicted. I wanted to let that section play because I wanted to show how Jordan Peterson brilliantly and calmly dismantled these two feminists. If you learn nothing from this conversation, at least take away this. A quality of opportunity is the measure of how equal our chances of success are, whereas the equality of outcome is just a measure of what the results of a situation are. To break that into simpler terms or an example, let's say that you have an organization that's looking to hire. If they're looking for diverse hires, but they're hiring with the mindset of equality of opportunity, that means that they're trying to find a diverse set of applicants, thereby giving everyone a chance at the job. However, if they're hiring with the mindset of equality of outcome, regardless of how well the applicants do or their chance of success is, at the end of the day, the results is they're looking for this amount of black people, this amount of Latino people, this amount of white people. So essentially with equality of outcome, you have a quota. And in a fiercely competitive capitalistic society, you do not want a quota based off of some ill-fated characteristic that some government entity tells you or instructs your business to hire by. Because then you're going to have people in roles that are not qualified for those roles simply because they met a quota. To put it into even more simpler terms, masculine men ride for equality of opportunity because if we're not the best person for the job, then we don't get the job and we take accountability for that and we get bigger, better, faster, stronger through that failure. Weak men or feminists want to ride for this equality of outcome because at the end of the day, we must all feel included, which I think is a load of boosh. Let go. Can I just pick up on one thing you said a little earlier in the yeah. interview, which you said it's the moral guidance that you are, are, are focused on. You think that yeah. is particularly important. How do you square that with the behavior of perhaps arguably, you know, a prominent alpha male president of the United States, Donald Trump, um, when his behavior, I mean, he is accused of having an affair with a porn star when his wife was pregnant. How does that fit with morally reclaiming? Um, well, you know, I would the say that was rather clearly immoral. Right. Yeah, but you not, would not still, to be a target for emulation. But you not still would have voted for him over well, Hillary Clinton fair, as anti-politics. I mean, it's just how, well, how do you... None of that was on the, the table. And I said I might have voted for him on a whim. That's but all. you also said, say you started so. out feeling quite close to Hillary Clinton. Can I just come out yeah. on, on the... Very on quickly, because we've got to move on. In a way, I don't, really, I don't care what Trump does in terms of his private life, but sure. what I don't have is him stopping or potentially stopping other women having agency over their reproductive rights and lots of men taking those decisions, It's for all example. about where the moral outrage lies and what's yeah. more morally outrageous um, in, in people's eyes. Is it his behaviour or the identity politics for you? on the? Anyway, we'll have to discuss this another time. <laughs> just think about the pure, ridiculous of these media outlets to throw out such a wild allegation. This guy, Trump, has been accused of all of these wild alpha male cheated on his wife. What do you think about that? Well, you must think this way because you talk so positively of him and you said that you wanted to vote for him before. So you must ride for things like that, right? Right? Meanwhile, never giving Jordan Peterson the opportunity to be able to answer and ending the program before he can clear his damn name. Conversations like this demonstrate why decentralized media platforms such as YouTube has grown to the extent of what they have over the past several years. These people sit in their fancy studios and their big squishy purple chairs and they dictate what they want to do to you through their producers, their directors, their screenwriters, and the agenda that they want to push. But shout out for Jordan Peterson for holding his stoic frame throughout this conversation, thus demonstrating through that frame clarity and precision so that his arguments are not misconstrued. What I admire so much about Jordan Peterson is that whether you see him in a classroom, um, tutoring students, or you see him out on these different platforms getting berated by these people with clearly opposing views, he always maintains himself. Undoubtedly, these types of conversation as well as his schedule at the time that he was most popular had an adverse effect on his mental health and his mental well-being, which in my opinion culminated to his addiction that happened years later. But nevertheless, this demonstrates why this guy is so popular because while the world 
is clown in nature saying so much on mainstream media of the complete opposite of normalcy, he can just calmly talk through it and out logic your bull. Questions, comments, concerns, y'all already know what to do. Mediocre tutorials and reviews at gmail.com. Guys, what you think about today's video? Leave me a comment down below. Do you like reactions like this or the commentary that I can provide? Let me know. Let's have a conversation about it, all right? Until next time, YouTube.